Well, our speaker, Bruce Boguski, is an author, motivational speaker, trainer, columnist, and media personality well known for his ability to, to inspire others to do the impossible. Bruce knows firsthand the attitude and skills required to overcome physical and mental challenges. At age 18, Bruce was partially paralyzed in an automobile accident. Although doctors warned that he might never walk again, he left the hospital in a few months under his own power. After a two years struggle to regain full use of his body, Bruce went on to become a two-time state champion in racquetball and played on a state championship softball team. He later served as head baseball coach and assistant football coach at a high school level and later the men and women's tennis coach at a local university. He is a nationally known presenter on motivational tactics and mental toughness, training for schools, sports, and business professionals, and life. Please welcome Bruce Boguski. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. 1966, I'm going to take you back. It's going to be my best year ever. I was just voted all league as a catcher on my baseball team. They told me I had a cannon for an arm. In that football season, I was all league, all conference, all state, and Bowling Green called me and said, we're going to give you a full ride scholarship to play football here. It was going to be the most, the most fantastic year I've ever experienced. Now on the way to Bowling Green, I'm sitting in a back seat with two big kids. They were going to play football too. Kid on my left way, 340, going to play tackle. Over here, 220, going to play guard. Now the millennials won't get this, but I'm sitting between these two fellows in the back seat of a Corvair. <laughs> and, and you won't get this either, but I'm sitting on the hump. <laughs> and I'm scooched up in my seat, and I got my head resting on the seat in front of me. And I don't remember the accident at all. Mm -hmm. On the Ohio Turnpike, there was a drunken driver going the wrong way. He came across the median strip. And he hit the car that I was riding in head on. The patrolman told, patrolman told me they found pieces of my hair and scalp on the front and back windshields. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the accident, but I remember waking up. And the doctors came walking towards my bed and they said, son, you've broken your neck in three spots. You're never going to walk again. You're never going to play sports again. You're never going to coach sports again. You're never going to drive a car again. They had a whole list of all these things that I was never going to be able to do. And I fell victim to that for a little while. I started to believe, I started to buy into that. And then I, then I developed a list of things that I was never going to let happen to me. I was going to never let a person tell me that I can't do something. I was going to never let a person tell me what my human spirit was like, like Scott just talked about, and what I was capable of doing in my <clears> life. And I was going to turn this around. And I want to help you do it, too, because there's a few things that I learned from that. See, we have the power, this human spirit inside of us, we can do anything that we want to do. You heard Nito this morning. He didn't know how to speak English, and he came to this country and wrote 18 books. Wow, that's amazing. How many of you would like to write a book? Well, I met a young woman in, in, in Minneapolis that outdid Nito. She never learned how to read, and she never learned how to write. And yet she published a book that changed her life. And I bought a copy with you to prove this, with me to prove this. Because her book is called Everything That Men Know About Women. And it's <laughs> empty. There's nothing in this book. <laughs> she just was very creative. And this book changed her life. If you look at the back, she charges $3.50 for a book. And you might think our economy is not doing too well right now, but it says here, if you live in Canada, you pay six and a quarter for a book that's got nothing in it. The first year she had this book out, she sold 1.2 million copies. Wow. Now, would that have changed your life? Would have changed my life, too. So why didn't you write the book? Why didn't I write the book? Well, see, there's something that holds us back and stops us from doing things in our lives and going for those dreams. And if you hang around negative people telling you you're never going to be able to do something, it feeds this thing. And what I'm talking about is a part of your brain. It's called the reticular activating system. I never heard about that before. Maybe you didn't either. I call it the little voice in the back of your mind, because we all know what that is. And you might not believe you have a voice back there, but psychologists have proven that the average person has a little voice in the back of their head that speaks to us about 50,000 times a day. That's how many thoughts the average person has in one day. But you never hear the voice until you get in a pressure pack situation. And then you can't shut the little sucker up. And it's telling you things like, you're going to miss this shot. 
Don't ask her out. She's too beautiful. Don't buy that car. It's going to break down. Don't apply for that job. You're never going to get it. And pretty soon, we become paralyzed by our thoughts, like I was paralyzed by my broken neck. Now, if you don't believe that you have a little voice in the back of your head, let me ask you a question. How many of you, by show of hands, how many of you talk to yourselves? Rachel, whoa, <laughs> a lot of people talk to themselves in here. But I think one of you over here and one of you back over here you didn't raise your hand. And I understand that. Um, maybe you're new to the group, <laughs> or maybe you're sitting by someone that you like or someone you really respect and, and you don't want them to think that you're wacko, so you're not going to raise your hand. But usually three things happen every time I ask this question, the same three things. Number one, when I ask people if they talk to themselves, they usually start giggling. And they go, oh, well, 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 you know, I did once a long time ago. I don't know, maybe. Second thing that happens, people start raising their hands, but they raise their hands in a very special way. They go like this. <laughs> don't want to be the only one. Third thing is kind of amazing. First time I noticed that I was working with a football team outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I walked into the room with about 60 guys. I said, okay, fellas, who in this room talks to themselves? Two-thirds of them raised their hand just like you did. But I noticed the other third of them were sitting there going, Man, I don't know. Do I talk to myself? <laughs> I used to. I don't anymore. This guy's right. I guess he's right. And you know what? We all do this. But let me show you very quickly the one thing about your little voice. Your little voice, ever since you were a kid, has been conditioned to not tell you the truth about yourself. It lies to you about your ability. Now, I'm going to prove this. To you. I'm going to prove that you have a voice. I'm going to prove that, you, that the voice lies to you. But I need your help to do this. And all I need you to do is to guarantee me that while we do this little demonstration, you're going to give me everything you've got. You're going to give me 100%. It's only going to take 20 seconds. Can you give me 100% for just 20 seconds? Can you do that? Yes. OK. <laughs> Let's do that again, OK? This time, um, pr pretend like you like me, all right? Just act like you like me. And when I count to three, I want you to say yes as loud as you can. Ready? One, two, three. Yes! yes! Go oh, wow, I want you to come in every audience that I'm in, because that was 100%. So here we go. I want to prove your voice lies to you. I want you to take your left hand and raise it up in the air. Get it up in the air, as high as you can get it. Come on, as high as it'll go. Good job, that's great. Is that as high as it goes, young lady? Good job. That as high as it goes back there? Awesome. That as high as it goes in the back? Great. Now, now that your hand is up as high as it can go, I want you to take and raise it just one quarter inch higher. Go, <laughs> now put your hands down. Did you just see what happened? I just asked you to give me 100%, and you said, yeah. And then I asked you three times, is your hand up as high as it'll go? And you sat there going, uh-huh. And then I said, go a quarter inch higher, and what'd you do? You did it. See, it doesn't make any difference how good you think you're doing something. You can always do things better. I don't care what it is we're talking about. So how do you change the voice? How do you get it to be on your side? Here's a few techniques for you that you can use immediately, today, right now. Number one, I learned when I broke my neck. And it sounds so simple, but it's not easy to do. Always remember one thing. What time is it? Anybody know? Well, see, I don't know if you can see my watch. There's nothing in my watch. And people always look at me and go, why do you wear a watch with nothing in it? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, it was really cheap. <laughs> and number two, it reminds me of the only moment in my life that I can do anything about. When is that moment? Now. It's right now. This is the only, if you really think about it, it gets kind of eerie. It's the only moment that exists in your life. Everything else has already happened or it hasn't even occurred yet. You know, at Stanford University, they did research and found out the average person in our country spends 56 minutes out of every hour worrying about what's going to happen in the future and regretting things they did in the past. And only four minutes an hour in the only moment they can do or exert a force on. And the younger you are, the harder it is to stay in this now. And I believe it's our fault, my generation. We allow too many negative things into our daily environment. The things you see on TV, the movies, the newspapers, the music that kids listen. My first experience with this, I'm driving my kids down to Columbus, Ohio. My daughter, Allison, is turning 12 that day, and she's got 11 of her 12-year-old friends in the back of my van. Now, we're driving down to Columbus, Ohio, and we're going to see a group called In Sync. I know, and I heard they're coming back, and I'm going, and I hope Justin stays in America, and he's with them. And now, on the way down there, my daughter gives me a CD, and she says, Daddy, can you put this CD in? It, Jessica wants to hear track number five. I said, sure, honey, it looks okay to me. Oh, and I always did like M&Ms. But I found an M&M that as a father, I'm speaking as a dad now, something was wrong with this picture. 
A 52-year-old man driving a truckload of girls to Columbus, Ohio with that language coming out of that speaker. And when I started to visualize what this guy was speaking about and talking and singing about, and I thought the girls were see seeing the same thing, that music had to go. And if you haven't noticed, it's everywhere now. Yeah. Even in my favorite kind of music, and I love country music. I love being down here. I love country music. But there's some bad country. Did you read that article in Newsweek recently? Do you know what happens when you sing country music backwards? You sober up, you get a job, your wife comes back, you get a new pickup truck, and your dog finds its way back home. <laughs> now, I'm just kidding, but that leads me to point number two, how to change the voice. This is so sophomoric that people stopped using this technique. But here it is. It's called affirmation training. Now, if you've never used an affirmation, an affirmation is a positive statement. It takes you off the negative. It's a positive statement, always done in first person, present tense, like it's already happening to you. Let me give you an example. My favorite affirmation is this. I am always calm and confident under pressure. I am always calm and confident under pressure. Now, if you notice, there's two different body languages and two different voice inflections. When you change your body language, different areas of the brain are actually firing off and storing the information. And I want to get the whole thing involved. Now, people always look at me and they go, come on, man. Are you telling me that by saying good things over and over, you're going to change your life? No, you change your actions. If you don't believe you can change the way you think and feel by repeating good things over and over, let me prove that you're wrong. Has anybody here ever been to Disney World before? Well, then you proved you were wrong. Because if you're like me, when I go to Disney World, and I'm going at Christmas time, the first place that I'm heading to is the Magic Kingdom. Because I want to feel like I did when I was six years old. And I'll tell you what, I always take the boat over. Because when you take the boat, the, the horizon sort of creeps up on you. And the suspense builds gradually. And I got to tell you, I get chills all over my body when I first see Cinderella's castle. And I go through Cinderella's castle, take a quick left, second ride on the right. I go in there. And that ride is called It's a Small World. Has anybody ever been on that ride before? Well, then you tell me, when you get off that ride, what song are you humming for the next three hours? And your heads are going like that, and you can't stop them because that's what you saw and heard. And guess what? That's how affirmations work. If you say them enough, they come back into your mind when you least expect them to be there. It's like advertising yourself to yourself. Do you think advertising works? Yeah. You're darn right. That's why every client that I have that I work with one-on-one, -on -one, the first thing I have them do is make an advertisement about themselves because it'll stick with you. If you don't believe that, um, finish this sentence for me. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, fizz. Wow. Well, guess what? That advertisement has not been heard in its entirety for over 25 years, and yet people still remember it. How about this one? How do you spell relief? R-O-L-A-I-D-S. That one hasn't been heard for over 15 years, but you still remember it. That's how powerful. Oh, the other day I was speaking to the Cleveland Clinic, and I was talking to doctors and nurses from all over the world. And I said, how do you spell relief? And they said, F-A-R-T. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a lot of fun with that group. They were, and by the way, if you don't believe what I'm telling you now, the king of affirmations, he just passed away, sadly. His name was Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali used to walk around saying something about himself. What did he say about himself every day? I am the greatest. What did he become? The greatest. Arguably, but it doesn't make any difference what we think. In his mind, he really believed he was the greatest. I can prove that. In his book that he wrote, he talks about flying to Miami Beach. And the stewardess is walking up and down the aisle. And she comes across Muhammad Ali's seat and looks down and says, gee, champ, I'm sorry. But everybody has to have their seatbelt buckle before this plane's going to take off. And Ali looks up at her disdainfully and says, look, miss, Superman, Superman don't need any seatbelt. And she was quick, and she said, oh, yeah? Well, Superman don't fly any airplane, so you better buckle up. <laughs> and he did. And the point is, he really had this belief. Now, if you don't believe in that power, I'm going to show you why you really use an affirmation. And we're going to take a page out of Muhammad Ali's book right now. And what I'd like you to do is to turn to a person sitting on either side of you, shake their hand, and look them in the eye and say, hey, being me is the greatest. <laughs> Go on, shake their hand, tell them, being me is the greatest. Have some fun. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, come on back to me for a second. Let me ask you this. What's everybody in the room doing right now? You're laughing and you're smiling. Even the crabbiest person in here, and I got you picked out, is laughing and smiling right now. And guess what? 
When you smile, guess what? Your blood chemistry, if you work in the medical field, you know your blood chemistry just completely changed. And you know what? The neurotransmitters in your brain are completely different than they were before you smiled. And yet I see people that don't smile. They're walking all around Finley, Ohio, where I'm from. They walk all, all around this campus. You can see them without smiling. But you know what I've learned as I've gotten older? Whenever I don't feel like smiling, I carry my own smile with me. <laughs> and I take, because this is what I call an emotional state changer. Uh, sort of like that wand. Uh, you just saw a little bit ago when, a, when, a, when a, uh, there's road rage in a car behind me and they pass me up, I just hold this up. <laughs> and it changes their emotional state. And all I'm saying, to sum up what I've talked about today, is to never let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Develop that inner human spirit that Scott talked about and almost everybody that's been up here today has told you about. We all have different ways to access it because everybody in this room is different. And I celebrate your difference. Because you know what? I've talked to some of you at lunch, and I learned from you at lunch today. Some of the things that you shared with me, and I hope you learned from me here today. If I can ever help you out, you call Mike up, and I would love to come back and speak at your organizations. Thank you so much for your attention today.